Today is August the 7th, 2017. My name is Earl Willis, Jr. We're in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and today we're interviewing uh, Senator Mike Wilson. Uh, Senator Wilson, uh, where and when were you born? I was born in December of uh, 1951, and I was born in New Albany, Mississippi. Okay. Uh, did you have any uh, siblings, uh, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles that was in or were in the military? Yes, my dad had actually been in the Air Force right after World War II, okay. and um, he uh, wanted to go into the Air Force or into the service okay. uh, during World War II, but my grandfather would not sign for him to go. Okay. And so my grandfather, actually, my dad was the baby of the family, okay. and my grandfather had been in World War One. He was in the 1917 draft. That was oh. William Bailey Wilson. Okay. And uh, he never talked about it much. He fought in Bella Wood and all of that. And World War One got gassed, you know, okay. uh, with the mustard gas and oh, really, yeah. saw the trench warfare. And I, I'm sure uh, Granny had a little bit to do with it. That being her baby, she probably said, "You, you know, yeah. WB, you're not signing for him." So. And of course, as you being a Marine, uh, the Bella Wood, that's kind of where the Marines got their. A lot of their, uh, their uh, leatherneck, yeah, yeah, the right. devil, the devil dog, devil dogs, yeah. and leathernecks, yeah, yeah, all these different things, yeah. Uh, uh, what were you doing before you entered the service? Well, I was, uh, you know, working odd jobs here and there, you know, and I, I wasn't, uh, my life really wasn't going. Uh, in, in a great direction. I was in the draft lottery and I, my number came up 305, so I wouldn't have had to go in the draft. Okay. But it was one of those things where I really needed to be in the service. I got out of high school, I was only 17 and pretty aimless, And uh, but eventually uh, I talked to my cousin who had been in the Marines Okay. and all one night and I went down and joined the next day. Okay. So you, uh, where did you, was this in Mississippi? You went to the No, Memphis? this was actually in Memphis. Memphis? Yeah, I okay. grew up uh, mainly in Memphis, yes. Uh, so you, you enlisted? Yes. Uh, what was it uh, about the Marine Corps that, that drew you in other than the other branches? Well, I think that uh, every kid thinks about, you know, the Marines being the toughest and the uh, and my talking to my cousin, you know, they have to earn the title of the Marines, and yeah. uh, I mean, it was there's just something about it uh, that has a draw to it uh, for a young man okay. to want to be a part of that. And and they they're very different in the way their culture is very different. Once a Marine, you're always a always Marine, Marine. Yeah. right? You're never an ex-Marine. You're always a Marine, yeah. and and it's kind of this instant bond between you and somebody even though you've served at different times in different areas uh, because you always say to one another Semper Fi yeah. which means always, always faithful. faithful. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I know I interviewed a couple months ago uh, a gunnery sergeant and he said that he, was a, he wasn't a civilian, he was just a Marine. He was still a Marine. Yeah, right. And so, yeah. Uh, what, now, what year is this that you, uh, you joined? I joined actually, uh, it's a little bit of a delay, it was December of 1972. Okay. And I went to boot camp in January of 73. Okay. So the uh, Vietnam War was really winding down right then, right? Yeah, actually they signed the peace treaty while I was in boot camp. I think it was February of that year. Okay. And they announced it to us. Of course, all of our drill instructors had been to Vietnam and yeah. served there. Um, but yeah, we uh, wouldn't. Well, they still they were de-escalating and everything like that. And of course, they pulled everybody out in '75. Yeah, so. I was born the day that Saigon fell, April 29th, mm -hmm. 1975. So yeah. That, yeah. Right. Uh, so, uh, you, you, when you want the boot camp, you're talking about Paris Island, correct? Of course. Okay. I was not a Hollywood Marine. Okay. <laughs> uh, do you remember being sworn in? Well, we got sworn in at the AFI station downtown Memphis. You know, everybody t raises their hand and takes the, the swearing in, but they did it again once we were there. Okay. Yeah. Do you, uh, were you how did your mom and dad feel? Did they? Um, you know, I, I can't really recall what they said it just about it. I, I think that uh, they were just very proud when I would come home, want me to wear my uniform and yeah. go to church with them, that yeah. kind of stuff, so. Yeah. Uh, do you remember, did you uh, 
fly there or a bus or van? Or? It was my very first time to ever fly on a commercial aircraft. Okay. And I flew out of Memphis and then uh, we flew to South Carolina and we got picked up. Maybe it was in Charleston, I think, where we got picked up. Okay. And then from there, I took a bus ride. And of course, uh, they got to the last little key dunk store or, you know, 7 Eleven or whatever it was. And yeah. Bus driver told us that boys, if you want a candy bar or coke, you better get one now because you ain't gonna see one for 13 weeks. Yeah. <laughs> so a bunch of them piled off and you know got something like that, but I, I didn't do that. How how did you uh, how did you feel? I like to ask always when you were going there. Were you were you anxious or were you nervous? Were you scared or and what what were everything? Above? Yeah, I think you're a little. You're, yeah, you're definitely nervous. And uh, when those guys jump on that bus and start barking and yelling and everything like that. I mean, you get a little fearful and a little anxiety and, yeah. you know, and getting you off the bus and getting onto the yellow footprints and yeah. you have a word you've never understood in your life is lock up your body and what, you don't know what that is. So it's like, uh, what, what do I do, you know? <laughs> Cause you haven't learned about being no. at attention or any yeah. of those things. So. Do you, uh, do you remember, I, a lot of times I talk to the people and, and uh, the one, I remember a lot of times you get to boot camp like real early in the morning or like or, or late at night. Was mm -hmm. it dark usually? Yes, it was. Uh, it was getting pretty late when we got there, and um, I remember that. And that that night, uh, it was chi you know it was chilly, it was cold, and uh, being in this room, um, it's kind of like it's part of receiving coming in. And they had the radio radiator heat. Some of the really old buildings when I went through there. Yeah. And uh, just feeling like you're going to pass out because it's so hot, hot in there. Yeah. And you're having to stand at attention, which you've never had to do before, yeah. and that kind of stuff. So. So when they when you got to Paris Island and, and they, they got on the on the bus, did you say, well, you know, what about signed out for? Was it kind of <laughs> was it in your? It was really. Well, I, I know a lot of them had, but, uh, you know, like I was talking to my cousin. Cousin, you knew what to I knew what, uh, I pretty much knew what to expect, even though you think you know what to expect. It's still, um, it's something that you, you've never really experienced, though you've heard about it. So yeah. I knew probably a lot more than some of the other guys did. Yeah. Did you do a lot of, like, uh, physical training or PT before you got to the boot camp, or were you in pretty good shape, or? Well, I wish I had it done right. more. <laughs> but yeah, no, I didn't didn't okay. do a lot. But I was, you know, when you're young, you pretty, pretty yeah, pretty yeah. good, yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you is there any other uh, memories that stand out most at boot camp? Oh, I have a lot of memories that stand out with boot camp. I, you know, the one thing they do is they kind of, you know, you're riding next to the guy on the bus. He's got really long hair and a beard. And next time you see him, he doesn't have any of that, and he's got on utilities just like you do, yeah. and you're like, who are you? Yeah. <laughs> and we sat next to each other on the bus. Oh, I don't remember. You had hair then, you know, yeah. but they, they break you down and, and uh, make you all the same, and they go through this process to where they build you back as a team member. You'll hear Marines, if they get wounded on the battlefield, they want to go back as quickly as they can for yeah. their buddies. buddies yeah. You know, and, you know, you sign up to fight for you know God and country, but in the end, uh, you fight for one another. Yeah. It becomes a warrior type culture and yeah. a camaraderie, esprit de corps that you. It's hard to describe. Yeah, I, I, the, the guys I've talked to in the Marine Corps, they were very. I even I talked to a Lieutenant Colonel. He was about 85, 86, and he was still very proud. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 You, you become the day that you earn that title. Yeah. And that's what they say. You you know you have to earn it. Now the things that I've seen uh, when you when you're a recruit, you don't talk about yourself. Me, you talk about you the third person. Is this is it this yeah. recruit or yeah the, the private yeah all right yeah the recruit the private you, yeah you talk that way and then you had to request permission to speak to the drill instructor. You know, it'd be like, sir, Private Wilson requests permission to speak to the drill instructor, sir, you know, like that. And, uh, or if you needed to go to the restroom or anything like that, you had to request permission for everything. And uh, we had one hour supervised free time every okay. night. And that was it. And in that time, we had to go to the bathroom, we had to shave, we had to shower, 
we had to get all our uniforms ready for the next day and they would tell us you need to write a letter to your mama and one to your if you're married to your wife and you know or to your girlfriend and I want three letters up here you know on my desk in 10 minutes you know like that so and yeah. you had to shine your boots and brass so it you really didn't have any free time yeah. in, in boot camp yeah. so uh, now the weapon what were the weapon you was the M16 A2? now we were still we still had M14 M14 okay. when I went through boot camp the big, yeah. big uh, 7.62 yep yeah. 7.62 millimeters. So you, you probably know that pretty well, cleaning it, taking it apart and everything. Oh, right? yeah. yeah. Yeah, we had to be, you know, it's it's interesting because you have to qualify at the rifle range. And a lot of guys uh, that come from cities have never handled uh, a weapon. I'm fortunate. I grew up hunting and, you know, with my dad and everything like that. So I was very familiar with guns. And, and uh, so it wasn't that real hard for me. But these guys have... Seen <laughs> Yeah, they have to learn all about it and yeah. so take you had, it apart. You had, you had an advantage. You knew about uh, guns. Yeah. 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 Uh, was there any uh, instructor or drill instructor that stood out most to you? Well, I, you know, I can remember all of them, as a matter of fact, you know, that I had. Um, there was one, my senior drill instructor, who was uh, Staff Sergeant McNamara. He had okay. served three tours in Vietnam. Oh, really? And he had the Navy Cross and uh, actually saved, he was a uh, special forces recon, okay. and uh, actually force recon, and he would, whenever he had duty, he would bring us down there and tell us stories and, you know, motivate us, they call yeah. it the most, mo, well, uh, come on down and get some mo or something like that, yeah. you know, and, and uh, but uh, he had uh, saved his squad and actually took a pretty significant uh, wound and and still you know rose to the occasion to persevere and yeah. so he had a real gravelly voice yeah. and uh, probably didn't weigh 135 pounds soaking wet and wasn't very tall but buddy he could he's tough oh yeah he he if he hit you in the solar plexus man you knew it so he's kind of a stereotypical person you see maybe on a movie or something maybe oh yeah 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 had that real gravelly voice I can still hear it today uh, so when you uh, graduated, you, did your, uh, actually your parents, your mom and dad, did they come to yes. uh, Paris Island? Yes, they did. Okay. And I was meritoriously promoted from private to private first class okay. out of boot camp. And yeah. I was very proud of that. And of course they were too. And we marched on the parade deck, you know, and the whole thing. And you had it, your blue, did you have the no, blue lights right? No, we had, didn't. We had, uh, Seemed like we had uh, the, um, might have been at that time, summer service uh, khaki uniform. Okay. At that. Okay. See, it's been so long ago, yeah. it's hard to remember. Uh, so what was your MOS? What do you... I had a couple. I was a, um, I went into the aviation end. A lot of people don't realize Marines have aircraft. No, they don't. And uh, so I went in, I was... Uh, uh, started out as a 6077, uh, which was a ground support equipment electrician. Worked on the big generators that hooked up to the aircraft. Okay. And then I cross-trained when I was uh, with a Harrier squadron as a plane captain for them. And then my last duty station, I was uh, I worked in A6s, the A6 intruders, and I cross-trained, became an A6 uh, plane captain okay. there. And uh, that's 6013. And so um, that was probably one of the, the best duty stations I think I had. I was in, in Southern California at oh, that okay. point. Oh, okay. Yeah. Was that Pendleton County? No, it was uh, Marine Corps Air Station El Toro. Okay. And it's uh, right there at uh, Santa Ana, Irvine, Tustin kind of area. Yeah. Uh, where did you go for your training? Um, as far as like my A school, is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, like your, your, your Once specialty. Once I got out of boot camp. Yes, sir. I went to the Naval Air Station in Millington, which is right next to Memphis. Okay. <laughs> so I got to stay at home and drive out there. Okay. That was pretty cool. Uh, how long did that take? Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, see, when I think we were there probably about uh, 16 weeks, something like that. Okay. It wasn't long. Okay. Did you, uh, like, was it a classroom setting and you would take tests and hands-on stuff? Both, yeah. Uh, we did the classroom setting, um, and it was a mastery-based approach 
for electrician, electrical and stuff like that. Did you enjoy it? Oh yeah, I did. I, you know, I never thought I was real smart in school. I, I probably have a little bit of ADD or something yeah. like that because I barely graduated. Of course, I was more concerned about girls and yeah. other things. And but I never thought I was very smart. And um, but when I did the mastery based approach, I came out top in my class every okay. single time. So it helped you with your confidence, right? Yes, it did. It helped me a lot. Yeah. And uh, when I enlisted and took the test, uh, they said, what do you want to do? I said, what can I do? And they said, well, you, as high as your score is, you can do anything you want to do. And that's when my cousin told me, he says, you should ask for aviation. So I did. I got okay. that. Yeah. Uh, did you ever serve on an aircraft carrier? or? We, you know, our pilots had to qualify on aircraft carriers. They had to come in and, you know, you see them catch that hook, yeah. land on it. All of our pilots had to do that, and we would send uh, a detachment, you know, uh, of guys out on the uh, ship to take care of our aircraft. But I never had to go. Okay. Yeah, my so. dad, he was an aviation support mechanic. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, and I, I was the uh, embarkation NCO uh, for one of my jobs, and they sent me to uh, the amphib base in Little Creek, Virginia, okay. to learn how to load some ships and. Uh, then I went to learn how to load some of the aircraft because once the, the command came down, if we had to deploy, we had everything labeled and boxes and everything ready in storage. We could pull it all out, had packing slips, we could load it all up and be gone very quickly. Okay. Uh, did you, what would, uh, what was your, uh, did you ever see yourself working on like the, technical part of things when you were growing up or? You know, I, I never really thought about it. My dad was a millwright. He taught us how to, you know, change our oil and do the brakes on our car. And I mean, it was just something natural we did. Okay. And, um, I, you know, I just, it was funny. I just never really thought about it that much. But when being a plane captain, you do all the inspections on the aircraft. You okay. inspect the engines, the blades, and, you know, and all the, the landing gear and everything you see, look for leaks. And, and so we had a manual of that aircraft and we had to learn just about every system yeah. in the aircraft. So that's, that's pretty stressful because you've got people's lives on. It know. is. Yeah. And, and so you don't want to go around that aircraft and not find what's uh, wrong or potentially could yeah. be a problem with it. And uh, of course we'd take it through the cycle you know of maintenance to fix everything that was wrong and the pilot would make notes of things and and so we took care of fueling the aircraft and launching and recovering the aircraft and you know different things like that too as well uh so after you got your uh, your training was it in mississippi no it was uh, the training was at millington okay yeah which is north of memphis it's in tennessee okay. It's a naval air station. Okay. Did, where did you go from there? I went to uh, Southern California. I went okay. to Marine Corps Air Station, El Toro. Okay. And um, I was there, and they had, they had what on-the-job training. So what you've gone to school for, now you're going to spend about another three months doing OJT on exactly what okay. you went to school for. So you're putting all your, your learning into practice. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, did you have, did you... Uh, keep to yourself or did you have friends? What did you in your, your free time? Did you? Well, yeah, we had the uh, enlisted club and then of course we, you know, we're close to the beach out there. Yeah, and yeah. Wanted to go out to the beach, you know, we're young guys and we'll see the girls, yeah, you know, that yeah. kind of stuff. Going to uh, Disneyland was out there. Oh, really? Yeah, that's right. You know, and Knott's Berry Farm and there's just all kinds of stuff that's, that's so what was your What was your rank now? When you were um, I think at, uh, by the time that I got there uh, to my, well, I finished that, I, I think I made E3, okay. which is Lance Corp. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, do you, so is that where you spent your rest of your military career in California or? No, you're only there and once you finish what they call TME at that time, okay. then you get your permanent duty station. And my permanent duty station was MCAS Beaufort, South Carolina. Okay, so you went back to South Carolina. I went back to South Carolina, very close to Paris Island as okay. a matter of fact. And I, that's where I was with the Harrier Squad. Okay, uh, what would be your, your average, uh, the typical 
a day that you on your duty station? What would you like when you woke up? What time would you wake up? And what would you go about? You, how would you how would you describe that? Um, a typical day is you know get up, you go to chow, you know and, uh, and to eat the chow hall, and, and uh, you have to report in to work at a certain time, whether it's seven o'clock, depending on if we're on shifts, because um, usually we would work a day shift and an evening shift. Okay. And sometimes even a, a late uh, shift, you know, that would be from one to two, yeah. you know, that, uh, uh, so then you'd go, um, sometimes I'd work the night shift and do that, and, but you would, if you're working day shift, you go in, you work, you get your lunch, you go to the chow hall and eat lunch, come back, do your work, then the next shift comes in and takes over for you. Okay. And um, that's, that's pretty much how it works, and so. What did you do on your free time? Did you? Uh, well, Beaufort, uh, South Carolina, you know, beaches, we, they have beaches there, have beaches there and, and um, they, you know, every base has a movie theater and we would all go to the movie theater or we'd go to the enlisted club or, you know, there were clubs out in town and things like that too okay. as well. Uh, wow. So we did some of that and then of course the beaches and then we weren't too far away from uh, Florida. So we'd drive down there and go to Hilton Head Island and um, there in South Carolina. And, Okay. You know, too, as well. Uh, had you met your wife yet? Did you meet your wife when you were in the Marine Corps or you were out of the Marine Corps? Well, actually, I, I had, I was married when I went in. Okay. Uh, but the Marine Corps is not very conducive to marriage. Okay. And uh, so that basically uh, our, our uh, drill instructors told us that if the Marine Corps wanted you to have a wife, they would have issued you one. My dad said if they wanted you to have a, uh, whatever, they, if it wasn't your sea bag, then you didn't need it. Yeah. 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 So that was kind of the same, yeah. Yeah. So needless to say, um, it just didn't, really didn't last. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, when you, how long were you in the Marine Corps? I was in a total of eight and a half years. Eight years? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, when you uh, left the Marine Corps, uh, did you uh, use your uh, training or where did you go from there? Well, I had the GI Bill and you know, and I, I knew I wanted to go to college. So um, when I got out, you know, you go through separations and you know, that's 30 days doing that. And you find out about all the things available to you. And, and so I uh, checked into all that, got registered at the community college and um, got set up with a, a buddy that I had met at church. Okay. And uh, we became roommates, and so that was, uh, I started community college, and then I made it through that and transferred to a four-year school, which was Cal State Fullerton. Okay. And uh, finished up there with my four-year degree and graduated in uh, 1986. Okay, so you had you got your uh, bachelor's degree. Right? Bachelor's degree, yes, yeah, okay. in business administration. Okay. Yeah. And so, uh, where did you go from there? Did you... Did you get your uh, graduate degree or did you go to work? Well, I was already uh, pretty much working because uh, I had met a girl at church there. Okay. And uh, we knew we were going to get married, and uh, that was my wife, Deanna. Okay. Was, we're currently married and have been married uh, over 31 years okay. now. But uh, knew that um, we were going to do that, so I was still going to school. I had some finish up a couple of classes part-time. So we went ahead and got married, and uh, I was working, started working in the insurance industry out okay. there, and that was, and she was too. So, and I worked in the insurance industry for several years. Ended up being sales, sales manager, and branch manager for probably the largest auto insurance brokerage in Southern California. Okay. Did you think your uh, your being uh, military or being in the Marine Corps helps you like do that job or? Yeah, oh, I think that being in the military really helps you, I think, in any place in life, in my opinion. It, it builds discipline in you. Um, it also gives you, I think, some real critical thinking skills that you have to utilize in every situation in life that you have. So, yeah. I mean, I'm so glad I did it. I wouldn't change anything. Yeah, absolutely. You know? uh, so what brought you to Kentucky? So you're in Kentucky, so what brought you to Kentucky? Well, my grandmother lived here in Bowling Green. Okay. And so did my aunt and uncle. And we would visit, and uh, actually we were moving to Nashville. This was the whole plan. 
and uh, we were moving there and I thought well I looked and you know Bowling Green's only an hour away from Nashville so I got in touch with my aunt and uncle and then said hey you know my grandmother had since long since passed away and they let me stay with them and I'm commuting back and forth and couldn't find a place because everybody's coming back to school and apartments but as quick as you find one it had yeah. been rented and so my aunt suggested well there's a little house down here you could rent that and so I did and um, then ended up with a guy at their church that wanted to hire me so I ended up well okay so I ended up to make a long story short I landed here never left here and yeah. I'm glad I didn't yeah uh, now I think I remember before you did you uh, were you in charge of a radio station or? yes okay mm -hmm. uh, was it a Christian family radio station? Yes, it's a Christian family radio here okay. in Bowling Green. Okay. How long were you, were you the manager there? I was general manager. Okay. Uh, how long? How long was did that? Um... I was there twenty years. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Long time. Yeah, it is. And see, I, that was one of the things when I was in the military, and looking at the possibility of you know re-upping, you know, re-enlisting. Uh, one of the things I wanted to look at was uh, the public affairs office because they had guys that did radio shows and things like that. So I signed up, and you, I don't even know if you're old enough to remember this, Columbia School of Broadcasting. I don't think I am. Yeah, no. and uh, they had a correspondence course where you can okay. learn how to be a DJ and that kind of thing, and you did tapes, and, and then I developed a friendship with one of the guys that was in the public affairs office that actually worked for one of the radio stations out there. But that was the only time I did it. But once I got here, I developed a friendship with the station manager at that time. Okay. And he called me and said, hey, I, I need somebody to do the Saturday night show. Would you be interested in that? So I said, sure. I came out and started doing that. And then he wanted to hire me to do business development. And then he left. And, and next thing I know, the board's approaching me about being the general manager. Yeah. So you so, said that you did that for 20 years. Did you enjoy it? Did you enjoy it? I did. It? I did. I really enjoyed it yeah. a lot. Yeah. Were, I think I read, were you are a preacher? Yeah, I, I was doing some uh, preaching at that time, too. Yeah, I, so. I'm a preacher also. Oh, are you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it sounds like you uh, you like uh, being, uh, using your manager skills. Were yeah. Do you, you think that you, you learned a lot from the, the Marine Corps? Oh yeah, the Marine Corps really distributes leadership to the lowest possible level. Okay, even if you're a, a corporal or mm -hmm. or you still make. Well, you're, you're every Marine is a basic rifleman. Yes. And so you have when you have like a, you have a fire team, which could be three or four, and then you'll have a squad, then you'll have a platoon, then you know it goes on and on and on, yeah. and so you have. Uh, leadership, you know, you have fire team leader, you know, okay. that kind of stuff, and they equip you to be, you know, leaders in the Marine Corps. They really do. Okay, because you know, the, the the saying I've always heard is uh, every Marine's a rifleman. Yes. Yeah, and I've always thought that was pretty neat. And you, every Marine qualifies, requalifies with the rifle every year. No matter where you work. No matter where you work, and then once you make staff NCO, then you qualify with the pistol as well. Okay. In which I had to do both. Well, that was a 1911. They still use it. Was that the 1911? Yeah. And they hang it on as a bird and get it. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it was still a 45. Uh, so uh, it's August that you're a state senator now. So right. how did you get into into politics and what made you think about running for, for state senator? Well, let me just say it was never my dream to be in politics. I never dreamed of being president or I, it was the farthest thing from my mind. Okay. But being at the radio station, I would do a lot of interviews of uh, the uh, candidates, not necessarily candidates, but those serving in office okay. um, to talk to them about particular issues that we were concerned about. And, uh, and we would play those interviews on the air. But I was also a member of the Kentucky Broadcaster Association. Okay. And then I was on the Government Affairs Committee of the Chamber of Commerce, because I'm also a chamber ambassador too. Okay. And uh, in both of those areas, then we would go visit with our representatives, talk to them about the issues that were impacting our business or you know the line of work that we were in, especially broadcasting royalties, things of that nature. And so as it would happen, I really like policy. And you probably shouldn't serve in elected office like what we have if you don't like policy. 
because that's what you do. You make policy, okay. you make laws, and um, and so we would come back and you know be able to talk about it, and I would be able to explain everything, and and uh, people would say, "Man, you should run for office now." Oh, really? Yeah. No, 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 no. I was in the Marines eight and a half years, and I was definitely a Marine. They probably crucify me, <laughs> yeah. you know. And so I, we kept doing not, not doing it, and then when it came around one time, we we decided, okay, let's just pray about it. Threw my hat and ring in a special election, and didn't you know didn't get selected for that. Um, so I worked on the campaign to find out what it was like. Uh, came around the opportunity again, and so we uh, ran a three-way primary, won that with over 50 percent of the vote, and then. Uh, the, the general election beat an incumbent by about 10% uh, of the vote. So, okay. Yeah. So was that 2009 or 10? 10. 10? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And you, I like we were talking, you start, did you start off representing one of the counties was, was Butler County? Yeah, I was representing all of Bourne and all of Butler County. Okay. But, but uh, they redistricted, and of course the census was 2010. Okay. And, but it didn't, I don't think we redistricted until 2012, something like that. Yeah. Uh, it took us a couple of years to get it done. And when we did, because Warren County had grown so much, a Senate district's 115,000 people. Okay. Uh, a, a representative represents 44,000, and a senator represents 115. Okay. And so Warren County had grown so much that I lost Butler County because the Warren County yeah. became a perfect yeah. uh, senatorial district size. Yeah, we were talking about that. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, it's obvious, well, this is a veterans interview, so uh, I was reading that you're on the veterans committee. Yes. Okay. Could you tell us maybe a little bit about what you do for the veterans committee? Well, I'm, I'm a member on the Veterans Military Affairs Public Protection Committee. Okay. VMAP is what we call it. And, uh, you know, that committee, anything that deals with the state police, deals with um, uh, veterans issues whatsoever, any kind of public protection stuff, it all comes through our committee. It's all funneled to us. So somebody files a bill, it comes to us, we have the opportunity to ask questions, to examine it, to vote on it, and say yay or nay. A couple of issues that I've worked on for our veterans, particularly here in our district, is one, that they had opened these uh, internet gambling parlors that were here, and of course our uh, VFW and also American Legion, you know, they play bingo and yeah. charitable gaming, it's called. Yeah. And, and so they were just taking all these people away from them. And that's a lot of income to them that they utilize to, you know, pay their mortgages and everything, take care of the maintenance of their buildings. And, and so they, they really found a loophole to have these internet online, kind of all like little casinos. Okay. And so I passed legislation to make sure they knew they were illegal and got them shut down. Okay. And that took care of our veterans. And then the other one that I've worked on probably since uh, 2014, um, so that bit three years, is a Veterans Nursing Home. Yeah, we, we've, I've talked to Mr. Mm -hmm. Biggerstaff about that. He's real passionate about that. Yeah, he was. And I mean, he was, uh, he, he still is. He's very passionate. Yeah. So we were able to bring it to the place and, and they did the most of the work and uh, you know most all the work. I mean they did yeoman's work on this whole thing. I mean me, I'm just getting them in front of the committees. Uh, we're just putting together the bill to go ahead and authorize the funding because it's on the national list okay. you know, uh, for the federal list. But you have to set aside the money, the funding mechanism in order to get moved up on the list and that's okay. what we did this last time. Michael Meredith who's uh, another young and up and coming rising star in the, the legislature. Okay. You know, he had a bill and uh, we actually, uh, he got his out of the house and then I shepherded it through the Senate and the governor signed it, so. Okay, so it is gonna happen, the nursing home is gonna happen? It is gonna happen, but it's gonna, when it's gonna happen is another thing. Okay. You know, that's, everybody thinks, well, I got the bill now, is it gonna happen? It's like, well, it's got to be approved at the federal level first. Once they approve it, then we have to make sure we keep it in our budget. It's uh, we have to come up with about ten million dollars, okay. and uh, theirs is, their share is about twenty million. How do you think it'll affect this part of the, the country or this the state, the new the veterans nursing home? Well, you know they've done studies and a feasibility study, and, and they found and they project 
too as well. They look at how many veterans we have in our uh, area now. They look at the whole state and the, the projections of what the growth is going to be for veterans in this area and all the other areas. And at the end of the study, the most needy area was going to be our area for okay. this veterans nursing home. Um, and so what happens with that, of course, you open that home and creates jobs, it creates families coming into our community. It's a big economic development issue too as well, but primarily it's taking care of our veterans. Okay. Uh, so do you think this will bring jobs also? Or bring jobs? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, you okay. have to have uh, people to run the facility and you know, those that will take care of the veterans there too as well. So do you have uh, like a spot, you know, where you're going to put it in, or is that just way too far in advance? No, we do. We do. Um, the Trans Park out there was very gracious and donated some land to us um, that we're going to be able to use for building that there. Okay. Uh, as, as a senator or a state senator, are you... Uh, in session now, or are you not in session? No, we're in what they call the interim right now, but we're having committee meetings where the House members and the Senate members join together. We call them interim joint committee meetings. Okay. So you'll have, like I'm chairman of the Education Committee okay. in the Senate, and so my counterpart, they have an Education Committee in the House, and so we become co-chairs of the joined, the interim joint committee and we alternate. One month he'll chair it, next month I chair it. Okay. And we have agendas of different things that we know that we're looking at in the state to be able to vet those things ahead of time. Okay. Do you, do you enjoy being a senator? I do. I do enjoy it. I feel like that, um, you know, I'm here to make a difference. I think we've done a lot of things. You know, that's one of my things. I feel like uh, things that I said I would be for and vote for, I have. Okay. And we've seen those accomplished, so I'm excited about that. But I still still think we got work to do. So. Okay. So you said you grew up in Mississippi? Well, I was born in Mississippi. Okay. And my dad, when I was very young, uh, his family really came out of poverty, out of the Depression. And okay. uh, he was one of the ones that broke away and really made something out of himself. You know, he ended up getting an apprenticeship, becoming a millwright. And, uh, you know, we lived in South Memphis area in, in fairly new subdivision down there. And he worked real hard. He was a very hard worker. And, um, but we had family that was still in Mississippi. So he, he uh, would take us every weekend. We'd go see, you know, his mom and dad, my grandparents, yeah. uh, my wife's, uh, my wife, my mom's family was down there too. So we were always visiting there and I would go stay on farms when I was a kid growing up during summers and things like that. So, so. Uh, I interviewed uh, Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Hampton yes. three or four months ago. Right. And I asked her, I said, when you were growing up in Detroit, did you ever think you'd be Lieutenant Governor? She said, not in many years. Yeah. So when you were, well, did you ever think you'd be a state senator growing up? Never in my life. Never so, had any somebody, life. somebody told you that 20 years ago, you just laughed at him, right? I would have, yeah. I would have said, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty, uh, you both come from uh, very humble places and you've worked your way up for a while. Yeah. God's been good to me. That's what I can say. Yeah. Uh, in closing, uh, anybody's watched this interview, what would you have them tell them about your, your service in the military? What would you have them to take away from this interview? Gosh, it's it's hard to say. I think probably the biggest thing I would say, you know, for me was what uh, the Marine Corps was an, a really big decision that I think impacted my life tremendously. I would be a fan of seeing everybody either do some sort of public service or serve in the military for at least two years. Because I think you gain so much by doing something like that. Yeah, it gives you ownership. Yeah, and, and it build, it's, a, it's like a building block for the rest of your life. You have, you have there's a sense of investment and pride in your nation yeah. um, that I, I know that I still get chills when I hear um, taps played oh, or yeah. the national anthem. Or, yeah, I was going to ask you about you know, this. Or seeing the flag. It just, oh, yeah. Yeah, and I have a flag I like to put out, you know as well and, and it just it gives you that sense of ownership and pride of your country that you 
you've served your country like that. And I think everybody ought to have that. Yeah, it gives you, uh, you know, it's one thing to do when, if you, somebody just gives you something, but if you earn it and you've got sweat and blood in it, you feel like, you know, this is mine. Yeah, right, yeah. right. Yeah. Well, I really enjoyed talking to you, and you, uh, it was a real pleasure for you to come here, and uh, I thank you for your service, and uh, I think you're doing a really good job. And, uh, appreciate you coming here. Thanks, Earl. Thank I appreciate you, you having me. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you.